I'm AJ Banner, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wise, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Thor, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is AJ Banner. Hey, thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. I am your host, Hank Garner. You can find all of the archives of the show at hankgarner.com. And while you're there, please click on the subscribe links over on the right-hand sidebar. You can subscribe on your Android phone, your iPhone, it's Stitcher Radio, anywhere that you listen to podcasts, you can find Author Stories. We're also on YouTube. There's a link over in the right-hand sidebar as well. And you can subscribe there and never miss an episode. Today's episode is sponsored by the AIPP, the Association of Independent Publishing Professionals. If you are an indie author and you need to build a support team to help you uh, format your book, edit your book, get a cover design for your book, the anything that an indie author needs to get their book out there, the AIPP has a member that can help you make your book your product the very best it can be. If you look in the uh, show notes at the bottom of this episode, you'll find a link to the AIPP or go to AIPPonline.org slash members and browse through the member library and find the professional to fill out your team. Like I said, anything that you need to make your indie publishing journey a success, there's a member there to help. It's a very simple website, very easy to navigate through. Go check out AIPPonline.org slash members today and fill out your indie author team. At the end of the show, be sure to stick around for an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Thanks for listening. He enlisted for the money. He stayed for the girl. Gateway to the Galaxy, the new series everyone is talking about, beginning with Book One, Into the Breach. Frank and Marine Space Corps One find themselves across the galaxy in a WWE SmackDown with the legions of a boss-level villain. But the party's just getting started. He donned the mantle of a celestial knight to impress a girl, well, an empress. Now destiny's calling in a debt. A lightning-paced military fantasy full of outlandish comedy and impossible situations that will have you hailing for these Marines from the get-go. For fans of Green Lantern and the Stargate universe, listen to what some readers are saying. This is good stuff. Thanks for the new obsession. I recommend and can't wait for the next book. And the visual pictures and action are amazing. They're getting the band back together. And this time, it's serious nonsense. Pick up the Gateway to the Galaxy series by Jonathan Yanez and J.R. Castle. Available now on Amazon.com. There's a link to it in the show notes. Gateway to the Galaxy. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, today, I'm really excited to have John McGregor on the show with me today. Uh, John had a book out last year uh, that was an amazing tale called Reservoir 13, and he has a new book that's uh, a sort of a follow-up to that called The Reservoir Tapes, and uh, we're going to get into all of that today. Welcome to the show, John. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you. Uh, John, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh. Um, I'm not one of those people that that kind of grew up writing stories in notebooks and and dreaming of being a writer ever since I was five years old. I think um, I didn't start writing fiction until I was really university i think i tried being a filmmaker and that that had not gone well um my first memory of knowing that i wanted to make a go of being a writer was 
um, I'd written some stories at university. A friend had read them, and a friend had passed them on to another friend. And that friend, who I'd never met, wrote me a letter to say how much he'd enjoyed those stories. And that moment of connecting with a complete stranger was just incredibly exciting. Um, and that was when I knew I wanted to to try and publish my work. That's uh, th- there's no substituting that. Uh realization that you've connected with a reader with something that you completely made up uh what sorts of stuff were you writing then um <clears throat> very short stories um i'd written a, a, a kind of sequence of very short like 100 word stories and you know i was 19 but it was just that that sense that somebody somebody who i hadn't intended to read them had, had read them and got something from them. It was just, it was such an unexpected sensation. It was, it was really exciting. Uh, so what did you do then when you got this encouragement from a reader and you realized that this could be something that you had a talent for? Uh, how did you follow that up? Yeah, I think, I think I immediately started sending those stories off to, to publishers quite, quite naively. Um, and it obviously then took quite some time for that, for that to get anywhere. But, um, I think I just, from that point on, point on, I immediately took it seriously as as something that that I could do with my life. You know, I I, I had no illusions that it was going to make me rich or even kind of pay the bills. But I I thought, well, if if this person wants to read more of my work, then maybe some other people will as well, and that's that's, that's enough for me. You know, and and so I pursue employment, particularly you know, just did as little work as I could to to get by and was just really committed to, to writing more stories and, and trying to find out how to get them published. What was the first uh, story that you wrote that got the attention of a publisher? Well, it was eventually those stories, actually. Um, <clears throat> it, was, it, it was published in an anthology as a sequence called Cinema 100, um, which luckily not many people have, have read. Um, they were very young, um, very heavily influenced by, by Douglas Copeland, reading a lot of the time um but they were they were i mean they were exercised in form apart from anything else because they, they yeah there was a hundred stories and they were each exactly a hundred words and that taught me a lot about editing and, and concision and compression um it was a good training for it. we talk a lot about short story writing uh as as being kind of an overlooked art in a lot of ways in, in modern publishing, uh, the novel is King. Uh, and, uh, you know, but I'm a big fan of, of short stories and especially as a writer learning to, uh, learning the craft, learning to, to tell a story that has a beginning, middle and end, uh, how to uh, choose your words, uh, and, and keep the story pre- uh, concise uh, it, but when you start talking about 100 word stories, that's a whole other level of, of short story writing. Um, what do you think you learned from, from telling those uh, densely packed stories? Yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, they were often fragments more than stories really, but, um, but even within that form, yes, some, some, some of them were more kind of, uh, sequences of, of, of a longer story. Um, but some of them were completely self-contained and, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't take much to create a sense of story in the reader's mind. It's some incident, something to happen, something to change, um, some, something unexpected, some emotional engagement for the reader. And, and you've, you've got enough to, to kind of fuel the reader's imagination and, and, and let the reader kind of fill in the gaps for themselves. Um, so I've always, I guess since then, I've always kind of felt like you don't need to take very long to give the reader the kind of bare bones of a story. Um, and what was really, what was really probably really helpful about that process <clears throat> is the way you write a hundred word story is you write a 150 word story and then you edit it down and, and, and being so kind of pedantic about there's going to be exactly 100 words, you're forever, if you lose one sentence, you've got to add another word in somewhere else to make it make sense. And, and you don't become precious about any particular word or phrase. There's always something else that is going to do the job better or more concisely or, or, or with more kind of 
sense in a kind of technical sense. Um, so yeah, it was it was good. It was good training. What types of stories were those? Were, they, were these character-driven stories? Uh, were they a, a particular genre? Uh, could, what was your approach to writing those? Yeah, I mean, they were they were like I say, they were they were fragments. They were uh, they were character sketches, I guess. A lot of them were character sketches, um, little incidents. Um, they were, a lot of them were based on, you know, I was in the habit at that time of keeping a lot of notebooks and, you know, just, just looking out the window and seeing people and guessing what people were up to, imagining, you know, hearing half of a conversation and trying to work out what the other half might have been or, or seeing somebody do something odd and trying to work out what the background was. And so, yeah, I'd, I'd say... Yeah, a lot of them were about being young and being confused and, um, you know, being scared of growing up or scared of death or, you know, those kind of 19-year-old things. <laughs> right. Um, which is a very 19-year-old thing, but those uh, a lot of those themes have followed you uh, throughout your work. Uh, it, have you ever uh, noticed that as a conscious thing or is that just uh, just kind of part of your writerly makeup? Uh I mean, I think I have noticed or people have pointed out to me that one of the consistent things across a lot of my writing is um, you know, novels and stories which are about communities of people more than there's, – there's often quite a lot of characters in, in my books um, and there are perhaps – a lot of characters about which not much is known about. Or a community or, or, or a particular context. And yeah, I think I've always, always enjoyed playing with how you can make a bigger whole out of lots of small fragments and, and small kind of suggestions and sketches. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that's followed me through. Uh, what did you follow up that first uh, uh, anthology that, that you uh, submitted to? What did you do after that? Um, yeah, after that, I, I wrote a novel. Um, I, I, I was I'd been quite excited about the idea of just writing short stories, but um, I was encouraged to write a novel. So, so the um, so then my first novel was "If Nobody Speaks of Remarkable Things," which. Um, Similarly, and I actually drew on a lot of the material I've been drawing on for, for those first very short stories. It was it was set on one street um, in, in a northern English city um, on one day on this one particular street, and and it was a kind of again a kind of composite portrait of this community. I mean, lots of small narratives about people living in in, in each of the houses. Um, and how they related to each other, how they didn't relate to each other, um, kind of recurring idea that they, they they knew a lot about each other, but they didn't know each other's names. Um, and just a kind of portrait of of inner city life in the late 90s, um, which I was really keen to get down on paper. I think there was a lot of writing, there was a lot of kind of young British writing at that time about the city that was all about drugs and crime and poverty and nightclubs and and that was all well and good but I wanted to kind of write about the city that I was seeing the inner city that I was seeing that was just a mishmash of lots of different people getting on with their lives um, and, and kind of the, the the pleasures of living in the city I think was, was a big part of what I was interested in at that point Well, you know at there are so many books with these grand, intricate plots and uh, uh, derived, contrived stories uh, of of these grand, epic things happening, and and uh, normal people being thrust into the middle of that. And we we often uh, overlook that um, a, a neighborhood or a community as a as a microcosm uh, has all of the the drama and all of the uh, the 
the stuff that goes on right under our noses and uh, sometimes just peeling back uh, the top layers of what's already around us it can be very revealing and, uh, and and very exciting to watch and and we we just uh, pass over those things because we call them mundane uh, but it's the it's the the mundaneness of it all that makes it so uh, kind of epic and exciting yeah yeah absolutely I mean and, and that's been a kind of that's been a consistent idea interest um in my writing and in my reading um my whole life i'd say um you know kind of you know i wouldn't i wouldn't even agree that that, that things are mundane or that things are ordinary you know people talk about the idea of ordinary lives but i i, I kind of think you know nobody's life is ordinary to themselves and most people's lives are incredibly complicated and detailed and contradictory and tangled up with dozens of other lives and, and once you start kind of trying to unravel the way that people relate to each other the way people connect and the way they don't connect and the way they don't manage to say what they want to say or don't manage to get what they want out of life it, it, I just I just you know, it's endlessly fascinating and you know you can you can find those stories in any kind of context and you don't need yeah, it's it's not it's it's not even as if I'm shying away from the kind of the big narratives like the, the big crime drama or or, or you know, I don't know well crime drama is the obvious one but um, I'm not even shying away from the need to kind of use those parts. I just I just I I never do feel the need. You know, I, I kind of think well, okay, if you've got so with my first novel, there's a there's a car accident at the end of the the novel, and I think well, okay, you've got a hot summer's day in this English city, you've got people living in this street um, with all sorts of different backgrounds and then this this incident happens at the end of the day, that's it, that's enough. There's, 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 there's all the kind of complications and all of the different kind of expectations and, and desires and histories that, that go into that, that one incident. Or, or with the last novel, as well, 13, you've got a village of, of incredibly various people um, and this this one thing happens at the start of the book, and then the, the, the kind of impact of that lingers across across the following years, and you don't really need, you know, detailed detailed plot, detailed um, drama, because it, it's all there. It's all there anyway in people's in people's front rooms. Uh, between um, your first novel and, and Reservoir Thirteen, there were a couple of other novels. Uh, uh, in, oh. in between there, did uh, and and Reservoir Thirteen uh, is very similar in in tone and feel to that first story, uh, although the setting is different. But it's really uh, it's really your brand of storytelling still. Um, what about those two novels in the middle? So many ways to begin, and even the dogs. Uh, what were you pursuing with those books? Yeah, I mean they <clears throat> they're two very different books. Um and I think I don't know what do I think. I think lots of things. I think um <laughs> I were I was developing my ideas about about my writing, my ideas about what fiction can do. Um probably with each of them I was kind of lurching um to to, to wanting to do a very different project. So so the second one, so many ways to begin. Um, it's probably more traditional in terms of narrative. It's, it's, it's almost a kind of family saga. Um, it's about a man who discovers that, as an adult, that he's um, adopted, and um, he, he kind of goes on a on a on a quest to find his birth mother. Um, and, and and he's a museum curator, so it's it's about ideas of family history and, and authenticity, um, physical physical evidence for, for family history. Um, and it's about his relationship with his wife and, and his childhood and her childhood and, and, and their parenting. Um, and it's set in Coventry and Aberdeen and uh, in Ireland. And, and so, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's more traditional um, and it's probably quieter 
book than 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 the others. Um, but I was I think I was I was finding out a lot of things about my own writing while working on that. Um, and then even the dogs was was very different. It's it's it's, it's short. It's quite uh, not aggressive. amongst the homeless community in an English city um, and is about a man's body, essentially. Uh, the, the central character is discovered dead in his flat at the beginning of the book. Um, and then the, this kind of, kind of chorus of uh, voices who are his his kind of friends and associates um, who may or may not be dead themselves follow his body, the progress of his body around around Sissy as, as the police kind of claim it and, and, and it's a post-mortem and an inquest um, and a burial. Um, and, and that one I was really experimenting with voice and perspective and time and, and kind of what you can do with the landscape of, of fiction. Really. Um, it was kind of exhilarating to to work on, although the subject matter was, was pretty bleak. Um, I kept having to apologise to people once it was published. <laughs> Somehow that felt inappropriate, but it, but it, was, it was a really fun book to work on. That's amazing. Um, and when you got to Reservoir 13, um, you kind of returned to that style, like, like we talked about, um, of the... Uh, the look at the the microcosm of a community and all of the inner workings there, um, but there is uh, an an inciting uh, incident uh, in this book. And w- when I first discovered the book, I I thought I knew what the book was. Um, mm-hmm. I, I thought this was going to be a a mystery thriller, uh, and this was going to be kind of an epic whodunit. And and it's really not. Uh, it it's more of uh, how would i say it it's more of uh uh what this incident does to the community and how uh how they respond react and how this this thing uh kind of washes over the community and and the long-term effects of that uh what was your what was your initial idea for the book and did you have any expectations of what the book would become when you began it um yeah I did. I the book started as a short story. Um and the short story was about the initial search for a missing girl. And and that idea came about because several times I'd seen on on the news um images of of a a, a community of people, a group of villagers or, or whatever, um, having been called out by the police to take part in a search for something, somebody, usually a missing person. Um, and you get these images of, you know, a hundred odd people kind of spread out across a hillside or a beach or a woodland or whatever it is. And they, they move off in a line and they're searching for clues or evidence or, or whatever it is. Um and I'd seen this several times on the news, and I was really struck by the idea that if you were one of those people, you would start the day with like 100% earnestness and seriousness, and you'd, you'd be very kind of caught up in the tragedy of whatever the incident was, and you'd, you'd listen carefully to the instructions, and you'd, you'd set off walking, looking at the ground. The sorts of areas that they're talking about searching, it's going to take them several hours to, to, to cover. And at some point, your feet are going to get wet and cold. You're going to get tired. Into conversation with the person next to you, and the conversation eventually is not going to be about the thing you're doing. The conversation is going to be about what happened yesterday or what time you're going to be able to get back to feed the cat or walk the dog or... Or in this village's case, you know, bring the cows in for milking, um, and that tension between the tragic seriousness of what you're involved in and the inevitable incursion of everyday life into what you're doing um, was really interesting to me, and I was really kind of uh, drawn to it. And so the short story was about that search party, 
And by the time I'd written that, I then had all of these characters and this village and this landscape, and I knew that I wanted to kind of pursue it and turn it into a novel. And I knew immediately that my interest was going to turn away from the missing person. And I knew that the book was not going to be about her. And I knew that it's far more interesting to leave something like that unresolved um, because unresolved things are actually much harder to, to deal with and to process. Um, and that was what I was interested in, was, was how, how the village would respond and how they would process this thing that had kind of landed amongst them. Uh, when, when leaving the story unresolved for the characters in the book, uh, you also leave a lot of things unresolved for the reader. And I, I'm actually a big fan of that when done well, uh, of, of just kind of leaving you with a sort of an unsettled feeling at the end. And the, I, I love when I finish a book when I can just walk around for several days and just keep the story ruminating in my head and, and going, you know, I wonder what happened to this. I wonder what happened to that. Um, and, and there's a, a, a very specific art to doing that. Uh, and, and not just le- just cutting people off with a cliffhanger. Mm-hmm. Um, as, as you were writing this, did um, did you know that you were going to have this sort of unsettling end? And how do you think readers have responded to this kind of the nature of the storytelling? I mean, I I knew <clears throat> I knew that I was going to leave it unresolved, um, and my uh, the way the way that I thought I could get away with that was by never deciding for myself what it is that's happened to, to the missing girl. Um, because I knew that as, if, if I decided for myself, then it would become information I was deliberately hiding from the reader. And, and, and I felt that that would be apparent in some way if I was just deliberately hiding it. Um, but by not knowing at all and by, <clears throat> um, by specifically listing pretty much all of the all of the possibilities for what may have occurred um, and leaving all of them in the air. I hoped that readers would understand that all these things were possible and that the book you know the the opening passages are almost deliberately set up to read as if this is the beginning of a traditional crime drama and there's going to be the traditional unfolding of clues and evidence and, and, and resolution. But after that, after those opening passages, I hope for most readers it becomes clear that the book's attention is going elsewhere. And, and the people in the village refer to the case, they refer to the girl, they, they see the girl's parents occasionally, and it clearly has never left the villagers' minds, but, but there's no kind of cranking up of the tension of, of oh, this, this, could be the, this could be what's happened and let's investigate that further. The, it, the, the book's attention moves away, and I hope by the end of the book, the reader understands that they're not going to get an answer. Right. Nevertheless, nevertheless, some readers are utterly furious, and uh, <laughs> I've been I've been quite taken aback by the strength of that feeling. I, I, you know, people genuinely feeling cheated and misled and and done wrong by, and I. I it's, it's, it's puzzling to me because it's not as if in life, you know, these things happen in life. You know, people disappear and there is no closure. And, and that's an awful thing and that's, that's a difficult thing. And that, that was the thing I wanted to explore. Um, people expect fiction somehow to, to have more answers. I, it, that's, that, seems, that seems odd to me. But, um, Absolutely. Uh- well, by by the same token, though, the the book has found uh, a, a, a pretty great fandom uh, of people that really appreciate um, the type of storytelling and the 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 really introspective look at this uh, this community of people and how these these things that happen to all of us how um, you know it's really a portrait of of what things do to a community and how they interact with each other more and, and I, I think people have just become programmed for lack of a better word uh to that that certain 
crime fiction, it follows a certain formula. And while this book looks like one of those books, it's really not. Uh, mm-hmm. You recently won the uh, British Book Award uh, for Best Fiction of the Year for Reservoir 13. Uh, how did how did that make you feel? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> that was great. Um, yeah, I was really pleased. And I'm, in a way, I was especially pleased because it's a, it's quite a kind of publishing industry award. So that kind of spoke to the book selling community and, and, and publishing community being being behind this book and understanding what it was trying to do. And, and um, yeah, I mean, appreciating the way that it has chimed with, with, with most readers. Um, yeah. I mean, it was, I'd, yeah, it was, it was really exciting. It was, it was exciting to, to get up on stage and be given a, a, a trophy. <laughs> That's always nice. That's, those are always good times, aren't they? Yeah. Um, which brings us to the new book, uh, the the Reservoir Tapes. Uh, this is a follow up of sorts um, to uh, Reservoir Thirteen, and uh, this book had a, a really unique um, genesis. Uh, where did these stories come from? They they were not first intended to be published as a book, were they? Well, not not initially. Although by the time I started writing them, um, partly. I, I just as I was finishing the editing on on Reservoir 13, I was invited by BBC Radio 4 to pitch for a series of of short stories to be broadcast on on Radio 4, and they were looking specifically for 15 short stories which would be able to stand alone, um, but at the same time form a kind of coherent whole. So they you know, a listener has to be able to hear just one of those stories and get something from it. But also, if they listen to all of them, it would it would kind of add up in some way. Um, and they suggested, you know, maybe they could be 15 different stories about 15 people within one community and that there can be kind of links in that way. Um, and I said, oh, well, you know, that's, that's really exciting, but I've just finished writing this book and I think, you know, I, I need a bit of a break and I, I haven't got really, you know, where am I going to get the ideas for 15 stories and 15 characters who live in a community? Um, and then I was looking around on my desk and all the papers on my desk and the notes and sketches and, and, and everything else. And I thought, oh, hang on, I've got these <laughs> characters I've been working on for, for the best part of a decade. Um, so I pitched that and, and, and they went for it. Um, but by the time I started writing them, it was really interesting because then, you know, publishers agreed to, to publish those stories as a book as well so I was writing for the radio and for the page at the same time and having to kind of think about how those very different forms work you know how how a listener hears a story and how a reader reads a story are quite quite different and and it was a really interesting challenge but and it was really fun to to come back to these characters and to kind of explore them in in a different way from different angle and extend some of the stories that been lurking in the background while I was working on, on the novel. Um, do uh, do people need to read uh, Reservoir Thirteen before reading uh, the Reservoir Tapes? No, they do not. No, that was that was. There were lots of um, there were lots of uh, what's the word? I think the word a, a, a balancing acts um, while while working on the Reservoir Tapes. So I had to make them work for the radio, but also for the page. They had to work individually, but also as a coherent whole. And they have to work for people who come to it fresh without having read Reservoir 13. But they also have to work for people who have read Reservoir 13. So there's this kind of balancing act all, all the way through. But no, my, my hope is that, um, well, it's not even my hope. You definitely don't need any background information. And I think gradually I'm starting to encounter people who've read the Reservoir tapes and then gone on to read Reservoir 13. And it's really interesting to see how their reading experience has been, has been different to people who've read them the other way around. Obviously, I'll like people to read both. That's sure. the honest answer. Yeah, of, of course, <laughs> of course. Um, the, um, uh, will people that read uh, Reservoir 13, will they get more information in the Reservoir tapes that might help color in the story more for them? Yeah, yeah, they will. Um, 
they won't get any clues to the answer because there is still no answer. Right. But, um, but I mean, one one thing that I really focused on um, and, and was particularly satisfying actually was in in the novel in Reservoir Thirteen. I, I very deliberately left Becky, who is the, the the girl who goes missing. I left her as a very kind of blank character. She's 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 almost a cipher for the idea of a missing girl. Um, and her parents are, are left very much kind of in the distance in the novel. I, I didn't want to kind of dwell on what they were going through. It, it seemed kind of obvious what they were going through. I didn't want to depict it very in any great detail. Um, so her and her family are kind of in the distance in the novel. And and in these stories, I decided to to, to kind of bring them into the foreground. Um, and most most of the stories, well, all of the stories, are set. Um, just before she goes missing, um, so it, it's background in that sense, and and so we get Becky as a, as a kind of real present thirteen year old girl, um, rather than this kind of two dimensional image of the, the missing the missing innocent. You know, she's she, she's a real teenage girl, and she's hanging out with the teenagers in the village, and getting into trouble, and being a complicated thirteen year old. And then we meet her parents as well, and, and we get a sense of her parents' background and, and what was happening with them in, in the kind of days leading up to to her disappearance. And so it was quite, uh, I don't know what the word is, maybe cathartic for yeah. me as a writer to kind of to, to, to come back to them and to, to give Becky a bit more, uh, a bit more life, really. Right, right. Um, I heard you say once, uh, I forget where it was, uh, it was an interview somewhere that, that I, uh, that I listened to with you that, um, uh, you do, don't focus so much on, and, and I'm paraphrasing, so forgive me. Um, you don't focus so much on sex and violence, uh, in your writing, especially as plot devices, uh, because when you're, when you're in nature, uh, there's lots of sex and violence just, uh, as, being the nature of nature um, and in talking with you and in understanding uh, kind of your desire to get the, the real story of people's lives. Uh, is that something that ever surprises you that, that you don't need a lot of these tropes and plot devices uh, when you start really looking into people's lives? Yeah. I'm just, I'm trying to remember when I, when I said, that. I think um, I think I was talking about yeah I was talking about the, the, so there's there's quite a lot of nature writing for want of a better word it, it, particularly in Reservoir 13 um, and and it, it, it struck me when I was kind of halfway through this process that most nature writing is essentially sex and death and sex and violence um, and that, that's, that's kind of what animals do apart from eating um, is, yeah, I guess when it comes down to it, it's mostly what you as well. But I, I, yeah, I guess I've, I've never, almost at a kind of aesthetic level, what I'm interested in is what happens in the moments in between. So I'm, I'm, I'm never particularly interested in, uh, when I'm writing a fight scene, I'm interested in the tension that gradually builds up in those moments before a fight breaks out. Um, I'm also not that interested in writing sex scene. I'm interested in the aftermath or, 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 or you know, the, the, the dialogue that, that kind of makes the sex inevitable. Or, or you know, I, I, I like, I like the things that happen in the gaps. Um, and I like prompting the reader to, to work out for themselves that these things are kind of on the horizon. Right. Well, you can write a scene that, that titillates a reader for a moment or uh, a fight scene and, and blood splashing across the page, uh, if you will. But the the emotional fallout of both of those things can last chapters and chapters long. Uh, and, and that's the real that, – that those are the things that will stay with you as a reader uh, long after the, the initial shock of the actual moment. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think, see, while, while I'm saying this, I'm thinking of all the sex scenes that there are in both Reservoir 13 and Reservoir Tapes, but they're kind of, 
yeah, they're kind of brief, and I very much doubt they're titillating. But, um, <laughs> that's the thing. You know, like you have the you have the scene itself, then you yeah you have the lingering after effects. Um, yeah. Uh, John, I'm I'm a big fan of what you're doing. Uh, I, I really love your brand of storytelling, and uh, I hope you continue uh, telling these types of stories for a very long time. Uh, the uh, Reservoir tapes are available tomorrow when uh, everywhere when when uh, people are hearing this, and we're going to put links to uh, to all of your stuff in the show notes of the show. Um, if people are just discovering you for the first time, God forbid, um, where can they uh, find you online to follow along with? With your your books and career and everything going on, uh, yeah, mostly on Twitter, I guess. Okay, um, I am I'm, I'm John underscore McGregor on Twitter. Um, I, my website crashed recently. Oh, no. I haven't bothered to, to update it. I, uh, yeah, yeah, it's Twitter. Excellent. Um, but I'm sure also the Catapult um, have plenty of information on on their website. Absolutely. And we'll link it all up there. Uh, John, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. You're very welcome. I really enjoyed talking to you. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane series. What in the name of Carl Sagan was he doing in the cemetery on Halloween? What was he thinking? He whirled, expecting the headless horseman himself to be waiting on the road ahead. Or was he lurking behind? He wanted to run, but now the bridge ahead worried him. Doesn't the horseman haunt bridges? Could he avoid crossing it somehow? It terrified him. Why? It was just a stupid bridge. The gloom beneath could have been the lair of a troll. Billy Goat's Gruff. Mama used to read that. The troll waits beneath for the fattest, sweetest goat. Jason thought he saw something on the far end of the bridge, a shape of some sort. He stepped onto the bridge and gripped the knotty railing. He felt the ground drop away beneath as he edged forward. His eyes remained on the shape. It's nothing. It's nothing. Is it nothing? No troll attacked him as he reached the other shore. The looming shape was only a stupid stairwell opposite the bridge that climbed up the hill and into the main cemetery. He turned left and ran, admitting defeat and letting the fear take him over. He ran southward down the long, dark road. His initial burst of adrenaline ran its course and he slowed, then walked again, limping a little. Headstones slipped past on the right. He still had enough light that he caught his reflection occasionally in the polished stone. He looked very young and very thin. He could feel his vulnerability as he walked along. He grew aware of his own body, the touch of his starchy dress shirt and his jacket and the soft weight of his backpack. He saw himself reflected in the headstones, just a container of warm fluids, flimsy work for a blade or a hoof or a sword. He felt shatterable and transient, and his next breath was not guaranteed, oh no. The leaves made a faint oceanic rustle all around. The insects sang their three-note songs. Jason Crane, Jason Crane, Jason Crane. Jason sang a wretched pop song as he walked, something about having no self-control and no bitches and not enough money. He sang it softly, absent-mindedly, as if reciting a psalm. He passed Reese, Finnerton, Bain, Ekdahl, Forest. Black. Small. There. He saw the gate at the end of the road. But the gate would be locked, he remembered. He would have to climb the embankment and cross over the churchyard. He could see the spire of the church above and the weather vane spinning against the sky. He would rather climb this gate than face that churchyard, but the spikes on top made leaping the fence impossible. Okay. Just be quick. Something caught his ear, a brittle, clipping sound. He scanned the crest above and saw a horse silhouetted among the graves. It looked to be tied to a branch of the locust tree. He had heard its hooves as it shifted from foot to foot. It rustled somehow. His breath caught. He forced himself to be calm and rational. 
some Halloween thing. Maybe for some event? He found the stairs and ascended, sideways, ready to bolt if necessary. He watched the horse, but when he neared the top he saw the rider standing upon the shallow depression of the horseman's grave. The figure was motionless, a dim shape that absorbed light and gave nothing back. He could make out the shape of the boots and the legs and two arms held away from the body, palms down. Just a man? But the cape of the thing was not normal. It contorted painfully, twisting in the air even though the wind wasn't blowing. It wrung itself and billowed and whipped slowly, as if the figure wore a wave torn from a black ocean. And above its shoulders, is he headless? Is he headless? <laughs>